Welcome back to our third panel on future skills. Um, in this panel, we'll be talking the, the, on the issue of uh, soft skills, as soft skills have started to earn space. And uh, it is expected to define the future of our industry and the future of how we work in this industry. As the shipping organizations are rapidly changing, striving to attract young talent, be aligned with the modern day environment, there is an urgent need for soft skills development. In order to add value to the business, shipping should adopt new training methods and techniques on how to improve these abilities. In this panel, in this panel we are joined by Adam Lewis, who is the head of training and operations of IMEC, Bill Moore, who is the loss prevention director of the American Club, Jeff Parfit, who is the director of Chip Maritime, David Patraiko, who is director of projects of the Nautical Institute, Maria Progulaki, who is uh, the regional representative of Green Jacobsen, and Bill Trulov, who is the managing director of Carnival Corporation uh, Center Training Center in, in Netherlands. So we would like to start uh, right away, and I would like to ask our panelists to have an introductory statement, starting with Adam. Adam? Uh, thank you very much, and, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really, to summarize my feelings on the, the issues we're going to be talking about today, I think we have a major disruption and a major opportunity facing us within the, the next couple of years. The major disruption will be the young people we're bringing into the industry. Um, and I mean that in the greatest respect, that these young people are going to be coming to the industry with a whole different mindset. They're going to be coming with different expectations. Um, they're going to think differently. They're going to want to learn differently. And they're going to want to have new things out of their career. Uh, let alone, they're going to have new expectations about sustainability, which is something we're going to have to address. On the biggest opportunity, we have a lot of technology coming in. And even though for us it's new technology, it's been tried and tested in other organizations. And there's, there's a lot of research we can learn before we implement it in our industry. The only other thing I want to mention is, is talking about new technology and, and especially with COVID acting as a catalyst to drive some technology forward. I think we've got to bear in mind that we mustn't lose our core skills. First and foremost, our seafarers, our seamen. And I think it's all too easy to look at this new technology and forget that they still need good things like ship handling skills, collision regulations, and even safe uh, manual handling. So we've all, always got to bear that in mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, someone has, uh, I would like to ask you to mute the live stream. Okay, let's proceed. Now, uh, Bill, if you could be kind enough to unmute and double click. Sure, double click. And I'm sharing my screen or are we? You got live. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Yes, thank you. Now, I would just like to, so I can I can move my screen by clicking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm trying to do that. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, really, what the ongoing challenges are uh, is for our industry is to make ships cleaner, safer, and more efficient. And really having to do that, meeting both the needs of, of customers as well as society. And that's those uh, challenges are ever present. Um, but we do know, you know that the industry has changed and basically that being a seafarer is no longer a lifelong occupation like it once was uh, many years ago. And as Adam had mentioned a few months ago, people coming in with different uh, ways of thinking, younger people, different ways that they learn, uh, different mechanisms the like. So there's a dichotomy that we actually have in the industry that we should try to, uh, to really address because it's uh, something that will uh, affect us for the long term. So what are the future skills for our next generation? Well, also just mentioned that basically new skills uh, we, we have to be aware that new skills will not supersede existing skills. Hard skills are going to be uh, continue to be required. Um, uh, uh, technology demands for that, as well as just the basic uh, fundamentals. But 
there are a new set of skills, soft skills that we really need to take in under consideration that basically need to be addressed within our industry. So the one point I'll make is that and there's a lot of discussion and uh, regarding STCW and uh, criticisms and comments and the like, but in, in principle, the STCW basically sets for the minimum competency requirements for hard skills and amendments to the convention and the code that took effect between 2012 and 2017 basically align training standards with new technology and, and operational demands. However, those things take time to implement, they're costly, and they are ever evolving. So uh, the regulation is always, uh, and you know, unfortunately, a step or two behind the actual uh, implementation and what's needed for the industry. Um, I put up this uh, slide because really, when really thinking about what's really needed for our industry, um, there are three general sort of areas. One is really an awareness uh, as it relates to uh, uh, environmental uh, issues. Um, there is a digital uh, competency and understanding of adaptation and data and analytics. And we've been finding a bit more, I've been hearing a bit more about uh, the need for computer programming, actually some of the basics. Now these are skills, all these skills that I put here are really for both ship and shore, okay? Um, and we also look at uh, soft skills, leadership, management, problem solving, teamwork, commercial proficiency. But then there's also something that binds all these issues together. What we're looking at is transverse skills. Now we could actually have quite a, quite a seminar just on discussing these matters, I'm sure. That could last us a couple of days, but here's really just a quick an overview of what we think about this matter. So what are the new training methods that we should be looking to apply? Well, face-to-face -face classroom and webinar training, of course, with COVID-19, we're learning new things and we're doing a lot more things virtually uh, or webinar uh, based as we're doing now. Face-to-face -face training is important. Uh, augmented reality, virtual reality are coming online more and more now that as that technology uh, becomes uh, greater. But also full mission, I'm, I'm a firm believer in full mission simulation in a team environment. But the facilities and the infrastructure needed for that is quite substantial and it does take quite a bit of time. But uh, if we're going to get the closest thing to reality, it's really the full uh, mission simulation and, and team environment. But we also have another, uh, another element basically uh, that e-learning tools provide tools to gain and, re and retrain on the underlying knowledge requirements on the competency side, not so much, but on the, on the, on the uh, knowledge side, they're, they're very useful tools. What training do the latest maritime accidents reveal? Well, since joining the American club uh, so many years ago, it seems, um, we've been basically following a very basic approach. And we really look at a record of our claims, condition surveys, uh, and that they provide the background and the data for us to, to really get a feel for what the major P&I related risks are. In addition, we look at and study large casualty incident reports. Um, of course, those are that are made public and have an impact on the industry. And of course, assessment of regulatory changes upon uh, the PNI risk profile. For example, the the cyber cyber risks uh, uh, that are coming forth for 2021, and what we just had with the uh, with the IMO 2020 on bunkering. So those things we consider, so we can develop the the uh, the, the training that's needed. So on the hard skill side, as I mentioned, we have quite a library. The American Club has quite a library, built quite a library since 20, 2005 at looking at guidance and uh, both in e-learning tools as well as uh, guidance documents and training seminars and these types of things on the hard skills related issues. On the soft skill side, we've really just made uh, a rethink on how we're looking at, at accidents. Uh, and we have just established what's called a good catch initiative that we are just now launching. And we'll uh, have more to talk about that, but that's very much focused on unsafe conditions on board ship, unsafe acts and near misses and near misreporting. 
and having a greater awareness on these uh, matters, um, situational awareness. Sorry. Uh, how do we better train our crew? Well, it's an interesting issue in that basically uh, the objectives to get seafarers to, uh, to retain knowledge and skills that they've already acquired. And we do know that over time, uh, should they not be retrained, that of course, though that skill retention uh, declines over time. So what we, the process really is to uh, create a process of training and assessment at regular intervals uh, for retention and skills, uh, retention of knowledge, skills, and desired behaviors as shown in the diagram here. So instead of just a decay over uh, at least in this example, two-year time period, just periodically review, periodically assessment, targeted training on targeted subjects, uh, help to keep the skill retention along the uh, time period, but also it, it, uh, it creates a different curve for the decay of, of those skills. So how do we train the trainers? Very interesting question. Um, basically, whatever we do, we should try to do it soon. And one of the, the important things I, I think is most, most uh, critical is really trying to draw people from outside of our industry, outside of the maritime industry, or in other indus industries like airlines and maybe tra other transportation uh, and, and the like. Uh, they have different ways of training in those industries that, and if we cross pollinate, I think that we can actually learn some things from them. And of course, vice versa. Um, one of the things that we what we try to remind people of also in training is that ex masters and ex chiefs, uh, we're not uh, saying something negative about them, but always keep in mind that they're not always the best trainers. Uh, they have certain ways in which they've been training, unless they've been trained in a certain way and apart from skills and on technology uh, and uh, soft skills. Uh, if they're trained that way, they can be uh, better trainers, but if they're not trained that way, um, they can be quite hard and rigid and uh, not necessarily the best trainers moving forward, just to keep that in mind. Um, but the beauty is that there are technologies that have been, technologies made these uh, training easier and simpler, uh, both for the, tra uh, the trainer too. So we can implement some of those uh, technologies in order to make that, that better for them. So on that point, I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, Jeffrey, you have to unmute, okay? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, well, good afternoon and thank you to Safety for C for the uh, generous invitation. Here at Chirp Maritime, we take a safety perspective uh, on, this, on this subject. The main objective of Chirp Maritime is to harvest confidential near misreports from mariners, whatever the discipline. And by analyzing the causal factors of these near misses, we break them down into 12 essential components uh, using the UK MCA's deadly dozen, the 12 significant people factors in maritime safety. And what we have found is one of, uh, is not surprisingly, one of the principal causes of near misses and incidents is communication. The understanding uh, and awareness of a situation, the, act, the actions and behaviors of those involved uh, in, in those near misses and incidents. And of course, communication is an essential element of soft skills. The ability to empathize, the openness to listen and conflict resolution. However, we also find that the causal factors tend to stay on the vessel and do not move down the gangway to the shoreside management and the wider maritime community. It's as if the blame for a near miss or accident always lies with the seafarer because there exists a company safety management system that the crew did not follow. We at CHIRP know that causal factors go way beyond the vessel, the systemic failure within shoreside management the inability to listen, to empathize, to understand that there is a developing risk that requires intervention. Where is the just culture? So when we look at this topic of debate, what soft skills are necessary to attract young talent to the industry, we feel there is a lot of work to be done. 
We know there's a basic helm course that is required for officers in the certification process, uh, but in the main, this is a two and a half day course um, of which the content is so wide, it cannot possibly cover soft skills in depth. Uh, some years ago, um, I was involved with Chevron, decades ago actually, and they had a policy of psychometric testing uh, before they employed their officers. So this is nothing new uh, and the industry is well aware of it. Uh, we feel this safety for sea discussion is particularly relevant to the current global pandemic, where 400,000 mariners are currently trapped at sea beyond their normal service. It's hardly an attractive proposition for an aspiring mariner, and for those shoreside, it is a mammoth task to remain positive during this climate. Uh, we feel there is clearly uh, a strong need across the industry for soft skills recognition to resolve this industry, uh, this issue now and for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I work for the Nautical Institute and Nautical Institute are very um, focused on human element. And uh, so it's not surprising that I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said here today. Um, one of the things that we focus on is why do people who have good training and good practices develop rogue behavior? And how do you spot that rogue behavior before it turns into an incident? And uh, uh, particularly uh, some of the points that Bill Moore raised about the uh, de decline um, in, in, in skills and um, being able to capture or uh, deal with error management. And it's very interesting because one of the lectures that I give to young people is about error capture. And so often I'm asked, well, I'm a bridge team of one, so what can I do? And there are a range of options of what you can do, but you have to be aware. Uh, the number one option is to call somebody else, call the master early. Um, others are the range of uh, technical uh, alarms and tools uh, that help you spot something in, in advance. So it really is that practice. We also believe very much in assessments, including on board assessments. And as Bill said, um, a master or chief engineer don't necessarily uh, make the best trainers. They don't necessarily make the best assessors either, but they do have to have the technical skills. So one of the things that we do at the Nautical Institute is we have a specialist course to teach those skills. And it's all about um, things like choice of words, nonverbal signs, timing, setup. Um, what's the difference between can you spot the tell versus ask style? And how do you then intervene? How do you tell somebody, um, perhaps a, a senior master, uh, that, they're, that not that they're doing something wrong, but there may be ways to do things better? And it's that whole communication issue. And you know, Jeff uh, went into that very well. So we agree with everything and we do have at the Nautical Institute a range of tools that we hope uh, to improve those skills with. And I'm happy to discuss those a little bit further in the conversation. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, now, Maria, you have to double click in order to initiate the presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, with the progress of uh, technology, um, we all need upskilling because you mentioned the, the digital uh, skills indeed however as we acquire new skills uh, we also need to remind ourselves of uh, some old ones so i will use this uh, five minutes to explain why i believe that ancient greek philosophers have something relevant to say about today's issues and future skills needed in the maritime industry and i will also use what we and our clients have learned from applying these principles in our safety delta tool. Just a second, let me, okay, we're here. So safety delta uh, is Green Jacobson's tool to build and maintain a proactive safety culture. The Greek letter delta stands for the difference between values. Here we talk about 
uh, work as imagined versus work as done. Uh, safety Delta is based on continuous crew evaluation, reflections, dialogue, and development. Now, what we have seen from uh, the answers of over 6,000 seafarers of many different nationalities is that senior officers are always the most positive compared to juniors and ratings. Now, why is that? Are they more clever? Uh, are they disconnected from the actual work? Are they unable or are they afraid to recognize their own incompetence? Or are they just overconfident? So what we see is overrating from those who have the knowledge and hold the years of experience. So the interpretation of this overrating possibly uh, lies on lack of insight. Now the Danik uh, uh, Kroger uh, social psychologists have examined the relation between confidence and insight in the field. And they found out, simply said, that overconfidence can get you into trouble. Pretty much what Thalys noted th hundreds of years ago, surety brings uh, ruins. Now, Danik and Kruger concluded that this bias results from either an internal illusion in people of low ability or and an external misperception in people of high ability. And they noted that people need mental cues in order to get insight. And this is also something we have seen among the Safety Delta participants. Seafarers change their view about their own performance and they take better decisions when they're influenced by external cues. Now cues, uh, require crew members to have a quality dialogue between them on board, between uh, ship and shore, and of course, with themselves. Uh, this is what Plato called the difficult dialogues, and he wrote a bunch of them. Now, on board, uh, we have a number of formal and informal cues. Safety Delta provides many cues because we don't want just uh, tick boxing safety awareness of seafarers. We want them to become situationally, um, to, to have this situational understanding that uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, the insight. Now, senior officers are leaders and leaders are humans. And as humans, they have their own perceptions, opinions, and attitudes. In order to make them to become more critical about their own performance, we need to challenge them, to make them discuss their perceptions, their opinions, and their experience. So in order to combat overconfidence, uh, we provide the tool to stimulate reflective cues. Do not add more paper. Uh, Safety Delta gives a mirror and a talking stick, and this has effect. Uh, take a look at the LTAF uh, statistics of a tanker company with 80 vessels after three years of using Safety Delta. And below, these are seafarers who acknowledge the positive impact of open dialogues, sharing ideas, and involving all crew members in decision making. Now, Heraclitus uh, said that the only constant is change. So we shall evolve through spirals of reflections, discussions, and learnings. So here I am summarizing the top three skills I believe that are needed in the future in the maritime industry. Ugnothis Afton, honest self-reflection on a mirror. Insight, Heraclitus very bluntly called fools those who are sleepwalkers, those who are present but are absent for the sake of safety, seafarers need to have instant, uh, sorry, insight. So situational awareness plus situational understanding. So be mindful. And the last one, dialogues. The difficult ones that we are afraid to do with our colleagues, with our peers, with our supervisors, with our partners, with ourselves. Now, these are the ones uh, that uh, Socrates employed through the dialectic method, questions and answers uh, with a series of arguments. So the future skills are ancient, they are sustainable, 
and they are portable. No matter how we call them, soft skills or philosophy, in my view, these are the ones that make people function better in any job role. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Maria. <clears throat> and now, Bill. Well, good morning and thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be part of this great panel. I want to start by first of all saying thanks to Apostolos and the great team at Safety for C for, for their leadership and for driving the conversation forward. I think this annual event uh, amongst many is incredible. Um, I also want to give a shout out and a congratulations to all those who have been nominated and particularly those who will be recognized in the session following ours with the Safety for C awards. Uh, each in their own way, contributing immensely to maritime safety. And uh, uh, obviously that's very, very important. And finally, I, I, I just wanna say a, a tremendous thanks and admiration uh, to all the seafarers out there and their families uh, around the globe for their incredible work and sacrifice uh, during this very, very challenging COVID period. Uh, one that has been physically and emotionally challenging uh, for those that are on the on the oceans and for those that are shoreside supporting. And I think through it all, it's reinforced a few things. Uh, as we've heard from other colleagues, it's reinforced uh, not only the importance of training, uh, the fundamentals, but also uh, the soft skills. Um, but it's really put, I think, an emphasis on a couple of things we've heard already, uh, the importance of communication. Uh, I think we've all been reminded of the critical importance of building resilience in our seafarers and their families and creating an onboard environment that supports all of our seafarers um, all the way through their career. Um, and I think we've all been uh, somewhat uh, perhaps disappointed in terms of how our seafarers have been looked after by some nations as we've moved through this COVID period. Uh, and perhaps there's some stuff to reflect on there. Um, near and dear to me, I think, and worth mentioning is, I think um, this COVID period is also uh, revealed further the mental health challenges across the maritime sector. And so as we talk about training and as we talk about soft skills, we need to think about it through the lens of how are we looking after uh, the fundamental needs of those great seafarers that we ask to leave their homes and go forward in often very harsh conditions um, and deliver critical services to keep our global economy moving. Uh, and soft skills are so important in all of that. Uh, maybe a couple of quick words to close out on CSMART, uh, clearly a training center supporting the nine lines of Carnival. Um, sadly, we too have been impacted by COVID over the last year. Uh, we had to suspend our training operations on site last March. And subsequently, we've gone through a significant workforce reduction uh, like many other areas in the cruise sector. But I will say at the same time that I couldn't be more proud of the team and how they have retooled to enable us to uh, deliver our product lines virtually. Uh, and this has in turn caused us to do a deep look at our content uh, and how we are effectively delivering it. Uh, and it's also caused us to invest a significant amount of resources and time in preparing our trainers to effectively deliver training in these new environments. It, it, it briefs really, really easy that we're going to do it virtually, but when you start really drilling down and understanding how to do that effectively to a training audience at sea and ashore around the world, it, it is much more complex. And so we've learned an awful lot and we will continue to evolve this capability as we move forward. Uh, I think that uh, certainly the fundamentals of bringing teams together at CSMART in the simulators and doing that full team training are important but we're also quickly realizing that there are new and innovative ways that we can also deliver the curriculum to our customers uh, around the world. And with that, I'll pause and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Bill. You actually covered, because I'd like to ask a couple of points about CSMART and you actually given the, the answers yourself already. I would like to thank you all for your initial statements. You brought a number of issues forward. I would like to start with the uh, first questions to all the panelists. And I would like to ask, I I'm sure that no one expected this corona pandemic. I mean, the breadth and the <clears throat> intensity of the pandemic. Anyway, the point is, corona pandemic is here. I would like to ask you, 
What has the corona pandemic so far learned to our industry? What have we learned out of it? What do we keep as we move forward? And what do we change as we move forward with respect to improving the skills of our people as sure on board? Starting with Adam. Adam. Thank you. Um, well, I think the COVID, I, I, I hear COVID uh, spoken quite a lot about how it's changed the industry. I don't actually think it has in terms of training. I think it's acted as a catalyst. And I think the way we adapted so quickly in training to go on to online training and, and so forth, uh, I think we were ready and it was just a sign of the times. And, and like I say, COVID acted as a catalyst for bringing this into the forefront. Um, what what I do feel is, by and large, it has worked well. Um, I think there are a lot of things we can teach outside of a classroom, uh, in in a virtual space. Um, I've had to adapt to it myself. I'm also a student uh, outside work, so I've had to move my course online. Um, and I do feel there's there's a lot of collaboration we can do uh, in in online classrooms. There's a, a lot of subjects we can teach. So I think that is certainly something to, uh, to to bring forward one of the things i think we need to learn from is that this is a whole new style of teaching um, and one of the things i'm is concentrating on at the moment is train the trainer courses and we've had to adapt this very quickly because you can get a, a fantastic uh, lecturer let's say someone who's been a captain and has 10 years experience in the classroom but now adapting to an online classroom takes a whole different dynamic um, using this panel discussion as an example, you know, all I can see is my, my fellow panelists. I can't see the audience. I can't read their body language. And it's very much the same when you're reading a class. So that is one thing we're going to have to learn and one thing we're going to have to adapt to. But by and large, I think this remote training has worked. Okay. Uh, Bill? Thank you, Postolos. Um COVID has made some interesting, it's, it's revealed some interesting things. And just to follow on Adam's point, um, I think that the the technologies, you know, like what we have here with, with doing things virtually and, um, you know, online learning for various uh, institutions or educational institutions have been, have sort of already been there. So this is just help accelerate what we're actually doing now. And, and I don't think it's it's something that all of a sudden we found ourselves in a, in a dire strait, in a dire hole, and we were not able to, to have the technologies and at least have some capabilities. And, and again, it's accelerating uh, uh, different ways of learning and different ways of, of going about things. Um, things that, uh, things that we drop, well, that's a little, that's a little difficult, to, you know. I, I think I, I do miss. I must say I do miss the face to face, and and as Adam mentioned, the the body language, the discussions. The when you when you start a discussion about how uh, an issue, you can go deeper and have a discussion about it. That is not as difficult to do, or that is not as easy to do in this virtual environment. Um, I guess maybe I'm old school, but hopefully that once this pandemic is over, we'll be meeting people face to face again and having uh, opportunity to have more in depth discussions. Uh, and this environment that we have here for the for the virtual has its benefits, no doubt, but it also has its drawbacks. And uh, that's what I feel out of COVID-19. Okay. Um, Jeff? Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, what, what have we learned? What has the pandemic taught us? Well, mental health is a, is a massive issue. And the lengths of seafarers' trips were already too long before this, uh, before this pandemic. You know, seafarers already serving nine month trips, in my opinion, is outrageous. But this pandemic has enforced much longer uh, uh, trips, and mental health is a definite serious issue. And we, uh, early on, uh, we were fortunate to have one of our members, a maritime psychologist, Dr. Claire Peckjan, write a very serious uh, paper on this issue, which we have extensively uh, distributed, and we still think it is the uh, the best paper out there on this on mental health. 
but we've seen an increase in suicides and depression. And uh, what is very disappointing is that the wider maritime industry, um, frankly, hasn't recognised the issues that seafarers are going through, how hard it is to do one day beyond your uh, designated trip, never mind three to four months beyond, and months beyond even the legal limit. Uh, and it's even disappointing to see some companies suggest that it is in uh, for the benefit of the seafarers to protect them that they stay on. So the whole thing about designating them as key workers, it must be very depressing for those stuck at sea, wondering where their help is coming from. So that's what we've learned. Uh, uh, for the future, I think this soft skills. Look, when we, when we really break it down, it comes down to money, doesn't it? It comes down to money and training and how much money is a shipping company prepared to invest in training? Or is it still happy to pay a, an agent who gets a bonus for uh, the cheapest transport they can get for cutting down expenses just to get a seafarer on that slot? So this comes down fundamentally to money and how much a shipping company is prepared to pay uh, for training. And it comes down to regulators, all of them who want to attract uh, shipping companies to their flag. And by doing so, they drop the barriers on training and qualification to try and make their flag more attractive. And I think that's what I've learned. Uh, and uh, it's a sad uh, uh, reinforcement of what I thought before the pandemic. Okay, just for the sake of the argument, Jeff, because what you pointed out is a, is a huge issue. Um, uh, playing the role of the devil's advocate, should it be, I'm just asking, should it be the ship operator's role to pay for this training? Should we consider, as an industry, should we consider part of this training to part of the basic training of the seafarers? It's something I would like to discuss. Just give, give us your views on this, because yeah. I'm, not, I'm not arguing, but we have to also face a real life challenge here. Yeah, indeed. Well, I, I'm only a few years ashore. I spent uh, nearly four decades at sea myself, the last 20 years in the offshore dive and subsea construction business, which I can assure you is in a desperate need for soft skills. It's a very aggressive, uh, aggressive industry. And, what I, and there is a lot of intensive training in offshore because it is such a specialist field. There are specialisms within specialisms. And so, uh, and the courses are very expensive, like dynamic positioning and so on and so forth. And uh, often that costs fall onto the seafarer, where the uh, employer would say, well, why, why should we pay you for these specialist courses? But my argument back would be, well, you're getting a free master mariner above and you didn't pay for that, you know? So there is, there is, do shipping companies want a high level of expertise on their vessels? If so, then they need to invest in it. Or do they, are they quite happy? And a lot of them are, just to have minimum manning and the cheapest labor costs. And that is a hard fact that we all know is out there and have to face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was also brought forward by the previous panel talking about the crew welfare. Yeah, um, the, 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 I think the point is clear. David. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just before I address those three key points that you raised, I'd just like to comment on what Jeff said about um, uh, who pays for the training. Um, it's, it's a very strange industry because it's not just um, things like the specialist at sea with the DP, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the shore positions. Yeah. So we naturally expect people to come from sea with all their knowledge, all their training to come ashore and be instantly um, qualified to do shore positions. There is no uh, um, competency um, for shore positions. So what we're seeing is that a lot of the management, the shoreside management of the ships, um, there aren't qualif qualifications for that. And a lot of the key competencies for shoreside management are, are, are missing. So it's, that's the other side of that coin. Um, what have we learned? Um, well, what we, I think we've learned, and this comes outside of the skills, is that people take shipping for granted. Um, you know, we've been flying under the radar for a long time, um, and 
we're very unappreciated and that's why we have so many problems uh, getting support and why we're not recognized as key workers. And I, I know Mr. Chairman that, you know, uh, Safety for Sea has done a lot to raise the profile of shipping, um, but we need to raise that profile outside shipping itself uh, in order to get respect for, this, for the seafarers and uh, allow those crew changes. Um, one of the other things, uh, when, so we've had um, a series of short courses, which we've had to convert to online. And we've, we've learned a lot. Um, and it's very intensive training in order to have that. Now, when we did the short courses in classroom, uh, we had a limit of 12 uh, students per the instructor so that you could get that um, very direct learning for these very soft skills. Uh, we've now gone down to eight. Um, but what we have learned is how exhausting that is for the instructor. Uh, and so we've had to take what would be maybe a six, seven hour day in a classroom and cut that down to three and a half hours with some organized breaks because of the intensity of the training um, in that face to face. And it has to be face to face like this. We're all sitting in, in front of webcams. Um, we've done trials with can we address a table? So everybody's sitting around a boardroom. And the answer is no, because you don't get the face-to-face, -face, you don't get the inflection, you don't get that human bit. So it's not just, we can plug everybody into cloud-based simulators. Um, you've really got to focus on uh, the human element of that because training is transferring skills through human activities. And um, that, that's so important and we must not uh, forget that. Um, what can we change? Um, I think there are huge opportunities uh, with, with the technology. And I think the balance is to understand what you can do online, what works well, and what doesn't. So learning how to use perhaps an Ectus, a radar, or a cargo system, et cetera, et cetera, that the underpinning knowledge might be transferable that way. But I think it was Bill who said about the teamwork uh, and the bridge team management and that side of, of, of the human relationships. Um, we're going to have to get either better at doing that remotely, and I'm not sure how, possibly augmented reality, um, but um, uh, we must not forget um, that, that human endeavor of assessment. And I know uh, certain companies are using algorithms to do assessments, but in simulation, the real learning comes in the debrief, and that's a mentoring skill. Um, it's not an algorithm telling you how many close calls you had. It's the human understanding why perhaps you had those close calls and trying to address the, those issues. So I think we've got to be very careful when we look at converting the assessment to algorithms. Uh, that's enough for now, I think. Okay, thank you, David. I, I see that Adam and uh, Bill has raised their hands. I'll give you 30 seconds. Uh, I, Adam. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, working for an employer's organization representing some 250 companies, uh, I've got a comment on what was just said about companies spending money. Uh, I'm not saying there are shipping companies out there who, who want people at the minimum cost, but there's also, I would say, the vast majority of shipping companies out there who take the trading of their seafarers very, very seriously uh, and spend millions of pounds a year. So uh, I, I just want to make that point. That's okay. Uh, uh, Bing? It's just a couple, of, and, and David's comments were quite on target. Uh, he made just a moment ago, but just on the, this issue of training. Um, it's interesting where, for example, worked a lot with for our members on behalf of our members on, on loss prevention related matters uh, uh, with our, uh, with their manning agents in places like Manila Odessa and places, but you know, it, it's quite difficult for, for the industry too. You know, not all ship owners are large, uh, large conglomerates. Uh, we have a lot of smaller ship owners. Um, so whatever skill sets they're able to, to gain uh, at the, uh, at the, the and, and training that's done at the, at the Manning Agents uh, facility as best they can, uh, can be a bit of a challenge. But also we find that some of the members uh, that I've had discussions with who are 
quite well known and quite good at their training. They, they have the basic training done at the Manning Agents facility, but then when they bring them on board ship, where that's basically they're on, you know, that's basically live simulation. They're saying, okay, we'll, we'll do some basic training on board the, or at the, at the, uh, uh, at the Manning agent level. But when we bring them on board ship and they have a, a strong management of the training of anybody on board ship once they arrive. So they don't have this high expectation of uh, very significant training um, on board, or sorry, at the Manning agent, but they basically take on that role when they come on board the ship. Okay, I think just to be fair, uh, I understand Jeff's point, and we have to be honest with that, and I fully agree with that Adam said, etc. I'm just saying there are 5,000 approximately ship managers out there. There are managers like Carnival, for example, one of the leading managers, let's say, on the cruise business, and they have a state-of-the-art center, and Bill is the head over there, and they're doing a fantastic work, but again, they control a substantial part of the cruise industry. I'm sure that maybe 10, 20% of these managers, they control more than 50, 60% of the global fleet. Absolutely. These managers may be doing a fantastic work, maybe more than what we expect. Jeffrey's point was for the majority of the industry. And the majority of the industry will fully understand what Jeff said as, as, as an issue. I'm just saying we all understand what is going on in the industry. They're not all these operators over there good guys and many of these operators are expecting to get the top tier let's say results paying bottom thing bottom tier fees and that's that's the issue and we all understand that that point without saying that this is this is applicable to the across the industry you know uh to, to be fair maria thank you apostle well what we've learned uh, we definitely learned that if you can't uh, be outside, uh, look more inside. Uh, we recognize the value of personal uh, communication and relationships, the face-to-face, -face. Uh, even the small talks with people you don't know or you just met. And uh, this has not been uh, quantified yet. It's not part of the equation, but it, it makes a, a great difference in people relations and in the learning uh, process and effect. Um, so this one-way training is limited. We know it for sure. Uh, we also turned to smaller groups in order to facilitate our courses. And um, they were already interactive. Of course, the mode changed. Uh, the mode had to change to a more digital virtual environment. And now we have to consider some other uh, drawbacks that people get, you know, uh, tired sitting on a chair for seven hours. Uh, th that's, yeah, practically, or you might have a cat or a, a baby crying, huh? but that's, that's normal. I mean, we're all people. Uh, so um, what to keep, I would say, uh, I don't miss the meaningless traveling. And uh, since I know your interest about the uh, green, well, this did some good, to Earth, and we have also to recognize that. Thank you, Apostole. I'm giving you uh, your <laughs> pass. You have the next move. <laughs> That's a nice statement. We have to, to bear in mind. And uh, Bill, your thoughts on that? Thanks. Yeah, I know some great comments. Uh, I guess a couple of thoughts. First, the question is, what have we learned? I would say, and I always do, and some of us are have gray beards here. What, have we, what are we relearning? This is not the first storm that the cruise or that the shipping industry has weathered. Um, so, you know, what do we want to get done in this very brief window of opportunity? Because this storm will pass quickly and we'll get back to regular business and we'll wait for the next storm to have the next discussion. So I think there are some really tangible things here that um, there's a window of opportunity to, to push forward a little bit. Um, I, I will say unabashedly really proud to be part of Carnival in this moment that the commitment to training has not waned. And indeed from the cruise industry perspective, one of the challenges, and, and I really liked Maria's, per, I think Maria's presentation is, we've had a lot of ships in layup or at anchor for some time now. Skill fade is a real concern for me at the moment. And so how I retool my curriculum to get at that skill fade um, problem set uh, is high on my uh, agenda list. Um, 
I think, and many of you have said it already, uh, again, a reminder that seafarers are not a disposable resource. They are a critical component to an international global economy with just-in-time delivery. Um, and we've seen through this version of the storm, again, of how that global economy can be disrupted very, very quickly uh, by one of these black swans uh, you know, situations. And so I, I think we need to, to stay focused on that. Um, you know, I think the biggest learning point again is that there are new and innovative ways to get the training to the individual. Uh, and then there are practical things that get in the way of that right down to the simple things of making sure a ship has enough bandwidth that you can get the virtual training to the sailor uh, when they have the opportunity to do it on board the ship or to their shoreside uh, location or in their home in some cases as we're doing with a lot of folks. And so we're learning a lot around how do you engage a seafarer who's at home between contracts waiting for that next opportunity to get back to sea? How do you motivate them to voluntarily stay current on their skills through virtual learning? Or is that indeed back to the other broader conversation? What are the expectations on the seafarer? What are the expectations on the employer in terms of creating an environment uh, for lifelong continuous learning? Thanks. Yeah, um, I would like, like to, to stay a little bit on this and I would like uh, to ask Bill, to elaborate a little bit on this. One of the, well, the spotlight now across the industry is within see, these seafarers who are stranded on board ships. It should be something in the range of uh, half a million, maybe 800,000 people stranded, I mean, stuck on board ships. There are hundreds of thousands of people who cannot disembark and they, these crew changes have to be affected and so on and so forth. However, there are a number of seafarers, an equal number of seafarers waiting to go on board. And these guys are stranded, let's say in brackets, ashore. So, and what you pointed out is, is a huge challenge. How, what sort of measures do you think should we as an industry embrace in order to keep them up to date? Because it's harder for them. Uh, they, they, they have been stuck over there for, for months. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? on what sort of measures, what sort of initiatives should we expect to see in order to manage this issue? It's a huge issue. So Bill T, I'll take it first and then Bill M after, I guess. Um, no, no. For you, it's for you, it's for you. Bill. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, this has been an issue we've been since we started uh, retooling to a virtual design, um, you know, reaching out. We are, we are essentially doing a lot of our training for those that are at home um, is largely voluntary and I think on the part of the recipient, it is they are recognizing that at some point the industry will come back into gear and they want to professionally be prepared to get back into the game as quickly as possible. Or in situations where sadly organizations have had to go through downsizing, um, you know, how do they stay current in an environment where they can't get out? And I know David and the team at the Nautical Institute are doing fantastic work in this regard. I think across the industry, we're, we're trying to figure out how we provide a menu of opportunities to all the seafarers to allow them to stay current and position themselves for the next bound at sea. Uh, and for those that are on contract, how do we continue to work with them to enable them to come back running um, when the conditions permit? Is anyone else for, yeah, uh, David, yes. I'd like to ask if anyone else would like to contribute or comment on this, uh, David, yes. I mean, there's no doubt that we have uh, extreme challenges and extreme hardship out there, and I don't want to belittle that at all. But um, as, as Bill just said, that there are some bright spots. So just some ob observations from what we've been doing. Um, we, when lockdown first happened and we had to transfer from our classroom uh, courses into uh, virtual, we assumed along with our customers and our clients that it was only a stopgap situation that as soon as people could get back to the classroom that was the preferred option but what we have found having done this for over six months now and surveying all of our students is very few of them would prefer to do this type of training back in the classroom and the reason i'd like to think it's because the course is so fantastic but the reason really is why would a seafarer on leave want to travel maybe halfway around the world and live in a hotel for a week when they can stay at home with their families? Um, 
So what we have found is with, with our courses, we've had people for years wanting to do our certain courses and they haven't been able to do it. Or, you know, they, they've been at sea, they've been this, they've been that. But now when we do a course, we can pick up maybe 12 to 14 time zones. Uh, people all over the world in all sorts of situations are able to tune in. So there is that added opportunity. And it was very different, again, just a, a new opportunity. We did a, a webinar um, last week, the week before maybe, with Wartzilla and Pradeep Chawla from Anglo Eastern. And they were talking about their cloud-based simulation. And of course, they're still learning as well. But the interesting thing is that Pradeep made the observation that now even small schools will have access to good simulation which they couldn't have had if they had to buy it outright. Uh, so that's an opportunity. The other opportunity, which I think is brilliant, is you know, they, they have something like 29,000 seafarers. Well, if there's an incident, if there's a lesson to learn, rather than waiting for all those seafarers to filter through the brick and mortar school, they can create a learning opportunity almost instantaneous and get it to the full fleet almost immediately. And that I think is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, so when I asked him the question, you know, do you think that this, this transition to the cloud will create fewer instructors? He said, no, because it technically should create more good instructors uh, targeting that kind of immediate learning of, of, of critical lessons. So that's another opportunity that's come out of this. Yeah, uh, I think Maria, you raise your hand. Yes, uh, well, based on our experience, uh, we noticed that training, especially for those ashore, uh, had to be uh, changed in order to be more relevant to the current situation. So we, we use this uh, COVID situation as an opportunity to uh, to exercise resilience, if I can say that. I mean, we teach resilience uh, in many ways. Well, that's an opportunity here. And especially for the show staff who are used to just throw it uh, on board. Now for the uh, training on board, it's completely different. We have to make it more entertaining. Uh, and uh, again, we have to keep the focus on safety because if these skills fade on board, then we can have a catastrophe. Huh? So it's even more urgent. Yeah. And um, anyone else? Yes, Jeff. Yes, yes. You, you have to unmute. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, you know, there's one, there's one body here that is, uh, is not being mentioned. And a, a partial solution to the training issue is to get the crew transfer situation relieved. And that is the IMO. And frankly, they're not doing enough and they're being proven to be ineffectual. They talk in the talk, but they're not doing it. And they need to be more influential and they need to be, need to be more direct with the member uh, states to get crew transfers moving. And that would relieve the necessity for uh, you know, a lot of the training requirements. Yeah, but uh, just, just to be fair again, I fully understand what you're saying, but the point is it's it's not only in the IMO hands. I'm sure they're doing what they can, but it, the number of stakeholders are being involved in this and the, the, the issue is getting uh, much more complicated now because no matter what IMO is saying, each uh, port state and each state may, you know, for COVID reasons say, I'm not doing this, I'm shutting down this. I'm, I'm. So you know, we all understand it's it's a much more complicated issue. But I, you, you, you get the point, I fully understand the point. If we have the crew change issue solved, yes, the, the issue will be relieved, absolutely, yeah. And then what is the purpose of the IMO if not to bring these bodies together and be effective? I'm just saying they're doing the best they can. I'm sure they're doing the best they can. I'm just saying maybe the whole structure of the industry may not be so effective to handle a, a complex situation like this. I'm not saying they, they, they do not have any any sort of being there. I'm just saying it's a much more complicated issue. I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, it's a fact. Okay. Uh, we understand that. It's a fact. So anyone else would like to uh, comment on the issue before I raise my next question? Okay. So my next question is about regulation. 
uh, Bill in his presentation pointed out the STCW issue. Uh, of, of what we all discussed, I think we all agree that the soft skills is, is, a, is a raising challenge in these days. STCW latest revision has been the latest amendments. It was back in 2010, the Manila amendments. It was a, a number of years uh, arriving into these Manila amendments. It was a revolutionary, let's say, approach back at that time. Now it's 2020. The amendments uh, entered into force in 2012. Should we consider maybe uh, introducing some of these new challenges and new opportunities into STCW? Do we need more regulation? This crisis have brought forward the words cooperation, self-regulation, guidelines, not necessary regulation. I'm not saying that we need, I'm just raising the question. STCW is the only regulation we have with respect to, to skills in the industry. I'm just like to, I would just like to discuss if we should consider revising or let's say introducing some of these uh, issues into the STCW, uh, starting with Adam. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I'm certainly probably a good seven years, I guess, away from the next STCW being published. Um, and I think there's going to be some fundamental changes, not just in some of the stuff we've been speaking about today, but also uh, even in grounds of te uh, technology and automation. Um, the only thing I think we find as a, a shipping organization is that STCW, of course, is um, a minimum standard. And it's normally companies' own requirements that are driving things forward. So yes, I would agree it'd be fantastic to put these stuff in STCW, but I don't think it's being detrimental to the industry at the moment. I think these challenges are being met. Uh, new innovations are coming into the industry so fast at the moment. Uh, and the regulation allows us to implement these. It's flexible enough to, to allow individual companies, individual sectors to implement them. So, so in short, yes, it'd be fantastic, but in the short term, let's keep doing what we're doing. Okay. Hi, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I have to just uh, uh, ditto the words that uh, Adam just made. Basically, I think where I made my point during the presentation that, that I think that the SCCW, as has been mentioned, is the minimum basic skills. But I don't look at it only as just the, 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 uh, the framework for, for that. I look at it as the framework. What, what are the hard skills we must know? and basically has a proper listing in them and organization of that. <clears throat> With standards, we go above and beyond that. The minimum standards are, of course, our own to decide. But uh, but I think, as Adam just said, I think the technology is out there. I think just do more of what we're doing now. It's uh, evolving well uh, as, as COVID has created a situation of, you know, as we shouldn't look at it always as, you know, uh, poor thing, but basically it's opportunity and challenge for us. So, yeah, I'd agree with Adam's comments. Okay. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, actually, Adam has nailed it with his, uh, with his statement, the STCW is minimum standards, and that has absolutely nailed it. And, uh, you know, it's hardly a country, a uh, flag state, that doesn't meet STCW minimum standards with its own training system. The problem is what is the quality of that certification from those flag states? So if, you know, you can have all the rules, we have got all the rules you need, but what is the compliance? What is that minimum uh, standard? And what this has created is a, is a term I've certainly become more familiar with. It's a race to the bottom because it still comes back to the, the uh, expense of training a crew, their qualification, and ultimately money to be, uh, you know, who's the cheapest, right? I, I cannot agree more because it's, you know, the, I raised the point for discussion and I cannot agree more. I think someone said the problem is not raising the bar too high and miss, but aiming too low and hit. And it's absolutely what you said, because if we are, as an, no, as an industry, I'm just saying, if we are all having the bar and aiming too low, then we are all okay. Are we okay? I mean, and that's that's what we're discussing here. Yeah. And that's 
be, that could be an issue. I, I could not agree more with the exact comments you, you brought forward. Uh, David. Well, we're very lucky at the Nautical Institute because the type of people that we deal with tend to be those who really are pushing the bar. And you know, I'm very pleased that we're doing some projects with IMAC uh, you know, to, to do that. Um, but probably what I see as the greatest weakness is not necessarily the regulations of what needs to be learned, but the quality of the instructors, uh, the quality of the instructions, and the um, the incentive for both the students and instructors to really do their best. Um, there's a lot of, you know, Jeff used the term race to the bottom, but it's race to a certificate. Um, what's the minimum way I can get a certificate rather than what's the best way I can embrace the knowledge here. Um, and you take things like ship handling, a huge important topic. Um, but uh, the STCW lists all the maneuvers that somebody should be able to do, but how do you get the practice to do that? Um, you, you, you might have one week a year in a simulator. Um, so you know, what, what tools can we use to, to help, help improve in that? And you know, we're certainly working on that at, at, at the Nautical Institute. Um, but what, one of the simplest things that we've done is we, we have a um, ship handling logbook, uh, which is basically an empty notebook. Uh, but with all the subjects in it. And it shows that you document how, what maneuvers you, you're practicing. And then there's a, a space on every page for reflection um, that you do with the pilot or, or, or a captain. And it just shows how you can inspire somebody to, to actually do that training uh, that's so important. Okay, Maria? Well, uh, we all agree that we're facing a huge challenge here. Uh, we, th there is a gap between the minimum level of competence by STCW, and uh, we're asking people to cope with these rapid uh, technology changes without giving them the, 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 the armor that they need. So um, the purpose of uh, regulations revision is to address the future challenges. And this is uh, Manila amendments back in 2010 tried to do that. They did address fake certification, um, e-learning. There was a framework set. Uh, now, elevating the minimum level of competence, um, well, has a risk because it requires resources in order to, um, to be able to really reflect this in practice. Huh? Uh, among the different uh, maritime labor supply countries. And uh, there is inequality of these uh, resources. So uh, it, it's a complex thing. Uh, there is another uh, point related to safe money because quality, but also numbers. Generally, we have all this capital intensive market. We have uh, sophisticated vessels, extremely expensive, modern technology, but they still need people. And uh, this, uh, they don't go in parallel. So uh, there is a lot of thought and uh, more measures to be taken and uh, many stakeholders to sit and discuss and really take decisions. Um, I worry about that as well because we can't even take decisions during an emergency right now, uh, a pandemic. Jeff, uh, you mentioned it and I, I totally agree. If not now, then when? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Bill? Thanks. Yeah, no, I think uh, on the SDCW specific, as Adam says, you know, there is time here. Um, in due course, I think we're all still learning, but what are those things to use the great US military term? What do we want to codify here uh, in due course in, in regulation? Um, but I think in the near term, um, you know, maybe a couple of points of celebration, uh, certainly from where I'm sitting, um, there is tremendous opportunity in the surge of willingness to collaborate and cooperate across industry and with third partners. And, and I think, you know, what I'm seeing is everyone coming to the solutions that coming to the table, figuring out how, how do we tackle the training piece. And certainly from a cruise industry sector perspective, uh, immense collaboration and cooperation as we look to get the industry back up and running. 
and think about fundamentals back to training and something that's consuming time for us is, you know, how do we train the mariner to go back to sea and live and operate in a COVID environment with thousands of guests on board and crew and everything else? How do we inculcate those new set of skills to do that safely as we move forward? And oh, by the way, don't forget the families who are also a bit concerned about their seafarer going back to the ship and then coming back home. So there are new issues here that I think really need to be thought through just from a uh, health and welfare of the uh, seafarer. Yeah, uh, David, yes, yes. Well, in, in this discussion, we, we've talked about training, we've talked about technology, we've talked about regulation, we've talked about cost. But one of the most effective ways of training that we haven't mentioned yet is mentoring, a simple mentoring program. Now, we've just launched a campaign um, uh, this week or last week, I guess. Um, we, we've been promoting mentoring at sea. Uh, we call it the 10 minute challenge in, in recognition that it doesn't have to be a lifetime commitment. It can be just 10 minutes, the time it takes for a cup of coffee. Uh, and you can do it at the same time. But just trying to, you know, when you talk to people on board ship, they're overworked, they're fatigued, um, they're too busy, but trying to create an environment where they consciously will take 10 minutes to help share an idea with somebody on board. And, you know, and it could be mentoring, it could be reverse mentoring. You know, there are all sorts of things. And it costs no money. Uh, it's often it costs no extra time. And you know, one the the the, the guy that does this, uh, who, who wrote the book for us, is a guy named Captain Andre Lagubin, who's our senior vice president at the moment. And asked, what is the one most important thing you can do to support mentoring on board? Is speak a common language in a common space, and it's a courtesy. It reduces social um, isolation. But if you walk into a mess room or into the engine room or onto the bridge, and all of a sudden people recognize you being there and start speaking English so that you understand, the amount that somebody can learn by listening to a captain and a chief engineer talking about how they're going to solve an issue um, and the inclusion of that. Um, we see a lot of ships now that have Ectus repeaters in the uh, master's um, office. Uh, so he only goes to the bridge when he sees a, an issue coming up. Well, Andre's solution to that is go to the bridge um, for a cup of coffee at least one watch, once a watch. No agenda, just build relationships. And one of the reasons why we've just relaunched this campaign at this time is because the amount of benefit, we know the crews are, are, are stressed uh, Jeff has very clearly outlined you know, how, how much pressure they're under, but that's why it's more important than ever now to start that conversation, to start building relationships, to get people talking together. And it's a very simple solution, but so effective and so critical. You know, there is no amount of technology in classrooms that's going to prepare somebody for a life at sea. You know, we absolutely rely on learning on the job and that's got to be helped. Now, one of the examples is uh, some ships, uh, their SMSs create an, uh, or, or inhibit an environment for mentoring. So for instance, the SMS may say, whenever you're going into port, we want the chief mate on the bow standing by the anchor. Well, that means that he doesn't get any time being mentored on the bridge. So that when he does become master, he doesn't have that experience. So little things like that, that we can look at and examine that don't cost money, that don't use technology, but do so much good. And I'll, I'll stop because I could go on forever. Yes, uh, Maria, yes, you would like to comment. Just a, a small comment, uh, uh, micro learning. It's very related to David's uh, point. Uh, learn as if uh, you're not wearing the hat of the student it's even more effective. Uh, it's, it's, it's a new trend, but it really does work, um, especially on board. And one more point, apart from the mentoring, I would also highlight uh, the collective learning. So learning from each other. Um, we are social uh, creatures. And uh, the value of uh, getting the other's perspective 
is is priceless. Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I would like to uh, go to another topic. Now, as we move forward, there's an ongoing discussion um, before the pandemic about the digitization and the autonomous shipping, etc. And there's a lot of technology, and the digitization in general has been accelerated due to the introduction of the pandemic. So, as we move forward, what should we as an industry, how should we adapt in order to accommodate uh, Generation Z, Generation Alpha, the, the next guys who are going to come on board? How do we adapt? David uh, helped us with a comment of the mentoring of how should we as an industry shift the focus and introduce new, new ideas, etc. So I would like to ask you how we as an industry should attract young talent and how should we adapt in order to make it better for them to make it to, to have a career in this industry initially on board and at the second stage we have to also um, admit the fact of coming ashore so so how should we as an industry adapt and prepare ourselves in order to attract and uh, retain this talent adam Yeah, thank you. This is an interesting one and, and one I've been discussing in a lot of autonomous forums uh, in the last couple of years. Um, like you said, as we know, people don't want to stay at sea that long anymore. And, and what we feel is um, that perhaps people want to come early 30s after reaching command. So they've got maybe a 10 year career at sea. Um, instead of really answering, it, I, I would pose a, a possible solution. And that's the way we're going it isn't to fully autonomous ships but we're gonna to go to a scenario quite similar to the space industry, where let's say at the moment, there's, a, there's the International Space Station up. Uh, there's probably six astronauts up there. None of them are driving the thing. They're all specialists uh, carrying out specialist field. Um, but in the world, there's probably about hundred astronauts. I don't know, that's, that's an estimate. Now the six are up there, the other 94 are down on the ground they're not just sitting around training, they're also innovating, they're doing work for the space station. So what if we adopt the same model? What if we adopt automation that reduces crew sizes on board, but you never really come ashore? So you might spend, let's say, four months a year at sea as a seafarer, and the other eight months you might be ashore as a superintendent. And what it means is you can keep up your skills, it means your superintendents are serving seafarers, it means socially you don't have to spend so much time at sea and we can use technology and automation to fill a massive problem for us um that might complicate the discussion a bit but i think there is a, a very good solution out there to attract new talent retain it and uh, and and make sure that we've got the skills we need okay um b yeah um like I said, I think we really, as I mentioned earlier, we really have a problem in my presentation that, you know, as we say that the maritime industry going to sea is not a lifelong occupation anymore. Um, people come ashore. Uh, some of what Adam just said with regard to, you know, that, how that how the industry might adapt to more of a, a <laughs> more of a uh, uh, space related type of, of environment that that's an interesting thought should we go that direction but um we also have an issue with the with people at, at on at shore or who are on shore um and trying to gather and gain those those experiences and maintain those within our industry as i mentioned earlier i think we have those who are the large organizations like carnival i think bill's presentations and really what they're doing and innovating uh, in that particular environment are very exciting, actually, and, and have the, the critical mass to do that. Um, for us as an industry overall, uh, I think there are challenges to that. Um, these types of, of ways in which you do things will maybe need more consolidation in order so to have a critical mass to go forward. Um, whether it, uh, it's a difficult question. It's a very difficult question. I, I, I really don't know what much more to say about it uh, than that. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I would also like to 
raise, as, as we progress in this discussion, I'd also like to, to raise the point of, of the industry who is flying under the radar as a very low profile. It's not that easy for the industry. I'm just saying but, a high profile. We also have to bear this in mind. I'm just, I would like to, to start the discussion and have your thoughts on this. I, I do understand it's, it's not an easy question. There's no, you know, uh, one size fits all approach. I'm not saying this, I'm just, like this is an issue we need to discuss. Yeah. We we are we are a bit of a diffuse uh, industry, as you well know. We have where you know we're the maritime industry with significant subcultures. You know whether it's uh, whether it's passenger, whether it's tanker, whether it's you know bulk and so on, all the different uh, ship types. So, and we're 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 basically spread throughout the 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 world. So, yeah, I see that I see what you're talking about, and there are challenges to that. Yeah. Um, Jeff? Yes, well, uh, semi-autonomous and autonomous shipping is a game changer and it's, uh, it's coming much faster, certainly than I anticipated. And uh, the sort of skills that uh, you're talking about, these, these high-level uh, digital and electronic skills, how, how are you going to attract those people to go to sea? Well, it has to be a real, it has to be a serious um, payback for them, which is usually financial. Certainly the prospect of uh, no shore leave wouldn't appeal to me. And the traditionally macho world of the seafarer, that's not going to appeal to these people either, frankly. Um, you know, I, I mean, <laughs> they, they, are, they tend to be of, of a soft skills uh, um, profession. You know, they, it's a very difficult one. And uh, I don't know if the transition is going to be very quick into this certainly semi-autonomous world where ships will be specifically designed for this function rather than the adaptation of existing tonnage. Um, so it, that the whole business about attracting people to sea, um, it's probably never been harder than it is now, you, you know, with the, with the pandemic. How do you make a life at sea attractive under the current situation? I, I went to sea for an adventure and I found it, but I don't see that adventure there now, with no shore leave, excess hours, long trips, low wages. You know, you have to face reality on, on, on what exactly do, do we want as an industry for the future and the type of people that we can attract. Yeah, uh, David. Thanks. Um, yeah, a couple of different issues here. One is the, the um, uh, recruitment retention uh, of young people. Um, and, and the other is the adoption of uh, autonomy. Um, just on the recruitment retention, I, I think one of the things that we fail to um, do for ourselves is to show people how much responsibility they're going to get at such an early stage in their life. Um, you know, taking over officer of the watch um, at, you know, 22, 23 years old is awesome. Um, and you know some of the ships that are being built now are really exciting. Um, you know I've been looking at some of the new builds that are you know the LNG new builds for for, for ice class, and they're extremely exciting looking you know equipment and the sense of achievement um, in, in knowing that you can control a vessel like that um, I, I think is is fantastic. Um, one of the more interesting things. Um, that I, I think um, uh, is, is interesting is the um, startup concept um, where now young people with ideas can actually create startup companies and there are incubators around the world and uh, companies that would help you do that. And I've seen some really exciting ideas from young people on how they think they can make shipping um, uh, better and more effective. So you know, that's an interesting side to it that'll come. Um, just on the other side of, of using autonomy and the design, uh, it's gonna be a long time before we have significant um, cargo ships that are fully autonomous, uh, just because you, you can't retrofit them. Um, you know, you, they've gotta be built from the keel up for that purpose. And we've got a lot of tonnage out there. Um, but what we will see is a lot of automation being used with the people 
And I think getting that balance of augmentation right and to make sure that all the seafarers understand their role with the technology or the technology's role with the person is going to be absolutely critical. Um, what, we, what we can't afford is to have a uh, seafarer think that the system is better than they are and therefore uh, they'll just let it do what it wants to do um, and, and, and be in watch mode. And the whole idea of perhaps a master being called out of bed in the middle of the night by a computer saying, you know, you've got it. <laughs> yeah, I've exceeded my limits. It's over to you. Um, is really frightening. But we did a major survey last year of our members and their ideas about automation. And they're very positive. You know, the number one use of automation is to reduce um, paperwork, uh, you know, bureaucracy. You know, let the computers do it. Um, you know, why, why not? Um, you know, we've got ships now that'll uh, identify uh, weaknesses in the system, order the spare parts, send it to the ship. And the next, the only thing that the ship understands is when the spare part comes, um, you know, with a planned maintenance system to change it out. So, but now I'll go back to my assessment um, argument. We need to make sure that these systems work. And it, it used to be, you know, 20 years ago, we would say, well, ask the mariners how they feel about it. But now some of these things are so complex that we need to watch, step back and watch how they deal with it. You know, they may say, I love this system, it's great. And, but a trained observer might say, yes, but you're not looking out the window, you're getting distracted or you're, you have information overload that you can't deal with or the alarms. So in aviation, they have something called LOSA, Line Operation Safety Systems. Um, do you know what? I'm not going to go there because I see we only have a couple more minutes. So I'll, I'll be quiet at this stage. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Maria. Um, well, I think that the new hands-on uh, skills are related to automation and um, programming. And uh, imagine that in the past, engineers could fix their cars. I don't think that many can do that now on a BMW with computer and stuff there. You don't touch it. So programming is a new hands-on skill. Uh, now, uh, soft skills, uh, to me, are, uh, we, we cannot substitute them. Uh, I feel naive thinking that I can foresee every single situation and every possible scenario. Imagine going to a war. Uh, you, uh, no matter the strategy and the plans and the tactics, until you reach the battlefield, it's only the few leaders that take the right decisions. So um, soft skills is what machines can't do yet. So uh, I again I stress the importance of this, these primitive skills, but they are related to our existence, survival, uh, resilience, all these fancy uh, words. Now, final point, you mentioned how to make it attractive to young generations. I wouldn't lie, it's, uh, shipping is for hard workers. I wouldn't lie on that and continuous learning. Huh? I have a 60 year old uh, master talking, discussing, sharing exp uh, experiences and re-evaluated how he would respond now with the current team and the current conditions. That's okay, but I'd just like just a quick comment on this. Yes. What David pointed out, the latest LNG designs what Bill is working about, the latest cruise ships, they're state of the art ships, better than five star hotels, especially these uh, latest cruise ships, they're state of the art ships. Not all ships necessarily are for hard workers, but I understand the point. Well, I understand the point of what you mentioned. However, we have good examples as well. Uh, yes, Bill hard workers, not manually. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, hand in hand, we need to, to have this user interface computer interface on these sophisticated vessels, for sure. Bill, your, your thoughts on that? Because I would like to ask one last question, a quick one, in order to wrap up the panel. Bill, your Perfect. thoughts. Um, 30 seconds then from me. Um, digitization, um, that's an attractor. Those that will come into the industry, that is their safe place. They understand it. They're the least of the problem. We're the problem. 
the older set who just aren't comfortable in that domain. So, uh, you know, digitization, autonomy, all those things, that will bring people to the table. Uh, on attraction and retention, uh, Apostolos, I said it last year at this time, a wise mentor told me long ago, we attract individuals, we retain families. We need to look at this issue through a family lens. Why does the Mariner's family want their loved one to go away in that environment? What's the value added? And then final point, we need to get beyond the 40 year discussion of whether there's a place for women in the shipping industry. They're there, they're vital. And how can we continue to have the circular discussion about 50% of the employment base? We must become an inclusive, diverse organization where everyone can perform and succeed and move um, to the best of their capabilities. And so uh, it's time to get beyond the question of should we, we are, and let's embrace it and let's celebrate it moving forward. Thanks. Okay. Um, now my, my last, it's not actually a question. I would like to, to have your thoughts on how we move uh, on the post pandemic landscape. What should be our key as an industry, our key priorities, some focus points, some buzzwords, let's say 20, 30 seconds, just to wrap up the panel, you know, to have some food for thought. Um, Adam. Okay, thank you. I think my takeaway point for myself would be uh, collaboration. I think there's so many things we've learned in the industry, uh, shipping companies as educational facilities, you know, P&I companies, everything. What we need to do now is share those lessons, work out how we move forward. Like we say, STCW is a minimum standard. We can set our own standards above that, but we're only going to know what that new standard is by sharing information with each other. So collaboration would be my takeaway point. Okay, Bill. Yeah, I think collaboration, but also uh, like what we're what we're trying to do now with the American Club. We've been thinking about the post. You know, we've been thinking about all this with all the loss prevention things that we've been working on. Very much focused on guidance and tools and training and the like. But now trying to move away, uh, move not away, but more directly, and and really have had the challenge of trying to figure out how to how to address the issues uh, that uh, what Maria is actually doing quite well with her, her organization is really looking at the softer side, but really focusing on seafarers uh, and, and situational awareness, situational uh, uh, hazard, hazard assessment and near misses and, and accident prevention on ships. Um, we're a P&I club. Uh, as you know, what it's just mentioned, Adam said, you know, PI clips are part of that, but uh, we're trying to focus on those things that are that we think are going to really, really affect uh, seafarers. And in the post pandemic, we've been putting out the uh, guidance related to the pandemic, um, but now we really want to reassess and I'm sorry, refocus our attention on trying to uh, focus on seafarer safety directly at the shipboard level. Okay, Jeff. Uh, I would like to see recognition and respect for seafarers, uh, respect that they are human beings like everybody else, and they have the same emotions, and that leaving home is just as hard for them as it is for anybody else. That's what I would like to see, concern for their welfare and the welfare of their families. Okay, David? I, I agree. It, it, it's all down to supporting the seafarer. Um, we've got some marvelous technology. We've got some influence around the world. Uh, they are key workers. Um, but if we don't get this right uh, in a year's time or even in six months time, we're going to have a huge percentage of our workforce who are going to be demoralized, fatigued. Uh, those that can't get to ships to earn a living will have will need to find other more sustainable employment. Um, and if we don't just pull out every gap to support the mariners and show them uh, not only as you know, Jeff has said that they're valued, but put our money where our mouth is. I mean, for example, um, that there are still ships that limit um, internet access uh, to cruise. You know, I, I, I mean, how absurd in this, you know, day and age when, you know, p families are worried about each other, how absurd to, to, to li limit their access to the internet. Um, so things like that. Yeah. Okay, Maria? I think this pandemic uh, forced us to do more slow thinking. I mean, we were crazy working, 
before yes. the pandemic. We were traveling, sleeping, traveling, sleeping, flying, whatever. So uh, it forced us to understand our presence, uh, what we do on this earth. I mean, seriously, I know it sounds very, you know, high level, but it is what it is. Um, so inside, I will keep this, uh, this learning inside and uh, not just uh, individually, collectively. Okay, uh, and uh, Bill, we uh, have two, on the panel. Sorry, maybe two quick thoughts. First, um, back to the seafarer, I, I think we need to have some really tough discussions. How in 2020 did we find ourselves in a position where we could not get our seafarers off the ships and home to their loved ones? In an industry that keeps the global economy going, there needs to be some very level, high level conversations and review of how did we end up in this position and how are we never gonna be in that position again? That's easy to say, hard to do, but I think it really needs some focus. Um, from a training perspective, don't lose sight of the basics. They'll always be important, um, but there's huge opportunity moving forward. Uh, soft skills, clearly key, uh, but I think we've also learned a lot of lessons about the importance of resilience in the seafare to be able to weather these storms. So how do we better enable that perhaps as we move forward? Real privilege to be on the panel. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much. Uh, I would like to thank you for your contribution. I would like to thank all our viewers. And just a remind for those who uh, missed the, the, the beginning of the panel, that the full recording will be available on the YouTube channel of Safe for Sea. Thank you all very much and stay tuned for the awards in a while. Thank you very much. Hey, goodbye all. Be safe. Thank you.